Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our latest edition of Where to Go Birding, Birding the Calendar. Uh, we'll be talking today about birding Tucson and Southeast Arizona in the winter. Uh, and Luke Safford's here to uh, share his tips on the best spots uh, this time of year to see cranes, sparrow, wintering sparrows, wintering ducks, um, raptors, and all the other kind of fun stuff that winter brings us. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Luke. Oh, you're muted, Luke. There we go. Thanks, Kirsten. Appreciate that. You shared a bunch of cool different birds that we'll talk about. And I'm going to start off with showing us a picture of a white crowned sparrow. So is that uh, very, uh, people are calling me, you know, very typical of uh, winter birding in the Tucson, Southeast Arizona area to come across white crowned sparrows all the time. So I figured that that's the one that we're going to uh, have on the front page. So <clears throat> we'll uh, we'll definitely talk about Frugian's hawks and long spurs and at the end, uh, we'll talk about where to go look for sandhill cranes as well. Uh, I've done a few of these different where to go birding uh, workshops, and so I'm always trying to figure out. All right, so I talked about this one in the winter last year, and you know all these different places that I've already talked about. So I try to get some new spots. At the end, we'll talk about some of those spots that uh, we've discussed in past sessions. You can see all those past sessions on our YouTube channel. And we can put that in the email that we send out to folks afterwards with the recording. Uh, and then you can go to those different um, <clears throat> uh, past videos and see more information about the areas. But today we're going to uh, specifically go and look at um, uh, lots, some areas in La Cienegas and then a special park right here in Tucson. And then we'll talk about some of those other areas too. But some things to think about um, whenever we get into a new uh, season. Uh, it's, it's good to process a little bit about how that affects our, our birding, uh, both the birds and us as well. So some different things to think about as we start uh, birding in December and January and February here in our area is that some key birds that really stand. I think of like this American casserole, uh, there's tons and tons of red tail hawks that migrate from uh, northern latitudes and then winter here in uh, uh, southeast Arizona area. So we have all of our resident red tails and then we have all of our wintering red tails that join them. So you just see a lot more um, red tail hawks during the winter. Of course, those are, you know, a pretty common bird for all of us. But, you know, along with those red tails, you also get the occasional ferruginous hawk. Um, they're actually a little bit more common and occasional, they're probably more like uncommon, but then you have rare uh, rough-legged hawks, and then you have a, a whole boatload of northern harriers that come in. You can get a few more white-tailed kites, especially in some of these areas that we're going to talk about. Um, uh, merlins, you know, other falcons come through, prairie falcons, so it's like a lot of raptors. And then my favorite uh, family of birds, waterfowl, you know, we, we don't get a lot of waterfowl in our area in the summer. They leave in kind of early spring, they come back in late fall. Winter is the time to see lots of good waterfowl, um, ducks and greaves, like ear greaves and western greaves. Sometimes you get loons coming through, um, hooded mergansers and, you know, cool, cool things like that. And then, of course, sparrows. We had that white crowned sparrow earlier, but you know, we get a lot of wintry sparrows, some really special ones like Baird's sparrow uh, can only be found here in the winter. They're not here during uh, breeding season. So they breed up in like North Dakota and uh, in the potholes region. And then they come in winter here, just like uh, long spurs. And, um, you know, we get an influx of American pipits and birds like that as well. So those are some of the bird families that I really pay attention to when it comes to uh, birding in the winter here. Something to think about, like I'm a, I'm an early riser. I like to get to the birding spot early, early, early. I like to be the first person there. It's kind of, I don't know, a problem I have. <laughs> I like to be the first. And, um, but sometimes being the first also means that you're there before the birds wake up. So especially in the winter, uh, sometimes, you know, so if sunrise is at 730, 
that doesn't mean that the key areas that are good to bird are getting sun yet. And a lot of times sparrows and warblers and flycatchers and, you know, actually a lot of the birds need a little bit of sun to really get them moving. So you can maybe not sleep in, but you can sleep in a little bit more than what you would normally do. Um, so I know I've scheduled a few field trips recently where we got there a little bit too early and it was, we could have arrived about a half hour later and still been all right. So just think about that. The sun wakes up the birds too. Lower elevation is always better in the winter. As you go into higher elevation, like up Mount Lemmon, up higher in Madera Canyon, the bird diversity decreases. Of course, I mean, you'll get some different birds up there, but just the diversity of everything really decreases, especially in the winter at a higher elevation. So if you want to have a really wide variety, you want to stay along the Santa Cruz River, you know, uh, the river valleys, um, you want to go to where there's water, and really city parks during the winter can be especially good. You know, they usually have some sort of water structure, they have ornamental trees that have a lot of berries and different things that attract bluebirds and cedar waxwings. You know, I think of Reed Park right now. We're not going to talk specifically about Reed Park today, but Reed Park right now is like hopping with birds. And it's, you know, a large park right in the middle of Tucson that gets a lot of traffic from, from a lot of different people. But you could rack up 45 species there in a couple hours, really. I was going to say no problem. Bit of effort, 40, 45 species is, you know, that's what you would get at a place like Reed Park. Um, so don't ignore those city parks. Try out some of the ones maybe that are a little less visited and see what's there. Even ones that don't have water, they have ornamental plantings that that the um, the birds really like. Provide a lot of food resources. And then my favorite thing about this time of year, uh, you know, December kind of maybe looking for some of those birds that you haven't seen yet this year, but hey, it's always fun to go out January 1st, the first couple of weeks of January. And it's like, it's like opening presents. Like you, you get all these new birds at the beginning of the year and you get to see your, your list climb up and stuff. If, if you're a lister, if you're not a lister, every bird uh, every day is new for you. So that's an even better way to do it. But um, just, you know, from a lister perspective, it's always fun to start that new year um, with new birds. So you may have seen an American kestrel uh, on New Year's Eve, but that doesn't mean it's on your 2023 uh, bird list. And so you get to go and, and find one uh, in January. So something to think about, something I think about anyways. Well, hey, let's go to this area that I really want to talk about, Los Cienegas. So I'll just preface this right here by a disclaimer. I couldn't find my favorite Los Cienegas picture of, uh, I led a field trip through one of the areas we're going to talk about, um, uh, Smith Canyon Corral and Tank. And I have this picture of me leading a field trip in that area and we're kind of walking through the grasslands. You can just kind of picture it and we're kind of in a line looking for long spurs and stuff. I couldn't find that picture. In fact, all my Los Angeles pictures are from like June and July. So none of them really worked. This is a picture of the San Rafael grasslands, uh, which is further south, but it's very indicative. It's very, it's very similar to what you would find in Los Angeles. So like these rolling hills, open grassland, a few mesquite trees. And then every once in a while you have these little uh, water tanks that are made for cattle that kind of are scattered throughout uh, the area. And they hold um, uh, great possibilities for all sorts of different birds. Of course, I mean, right, it's water. So sometimes you get some waterfowl hanging out in those tanks, you get American pipits on the sides and then uh, you know, the one everyone's looking for this time of year, long spurs. So chestnut color long spurs and thick bill long spurs, um, mostly. And then raptors love La Cienegas and the grassland area in, in the winter. So, so just beautiful out there. You get to see um, some mammals too, 
like pronghorn antelope. Um, and some in some areas you, you'll run into uh, prairie dog colonies. Um, and I talk about that in some of the, uh, in a different uh, where to go birding thing. If you want to know more about the prairie dogs, you can email me separately. Uh, but some other things to know about the Los Cienegas area, it's near Sonoida. So there's some restrooms in the little town of Sonoida. There's also some at Empire Ranch, which is on the north side of Los Cienegas. And we'll look at a map here pretty soon and kind of show you where that's at. So when you're out in some of these areas that we're going to talk about, you're not real close to a restroom, but just hit one of those beforehand. Um, really well-known spot in the winter for ferruginous hawks and long spurs, like I said, those are the two that really come to mind. It's about an hour from Tucson, so not that far away and uh, really easy to get to. Most areas, you can take any kind of car. Uh, we will look at one area where it would might be better to have uh, some higher clearance. So let's get into some of these specific areas around Los Cienegas. Um, the locations that we're going to talk about today, um, really three main ones, Curly Horse Road, Smith Canyon Corral and Tank, and then Davis Pasture. So this is, this is a map that you can uh, see in our um, Finding Birds Guide for Southeast Arizona. And Curly Horse Road is, is right here. I just put a little circle on it. You can see uh, the town of Sonoida down here. You can see there is a rest stop right there. So you can go there. There's also um, a gas station right at, at this corner here where there's a nice re restroom there too. But Curly Horse Road, you can, it's paved for a, a good portion of it. We'll talk about that. So that's that's a really good spot. And then Smith Canyon Corral and Tank is just off of Curly Horse Road, uh, right where that arrow is pointing about. And then we'll talk about Davis Pasture, which is on the south side of the highway, Highway 82, that goes um, west to east through Sonoida and kind of bisects Los Cienegas. And um, so Davis Pasture is on the south side of, of the highway. You see Ranch Headquarters is, is up here. That's a good spot to, to use the restroom and you can walk through Empire Gulch. We won't talk about that section, but that is where the bathroom is at. And then I, I can't show you this, this uh, map and talk about Los Angeles without talking about where to go for lunch when you're done birding, but the Copper Brothel Brewery right there, just uh, about where that O is at on Sonoida. Uh, really good. Um, yeah, so that, that's where I'd go for lunch after I, I brew these areas. So let's go, let's talk about Curly Horse Road. And you may not know, but Curly Horse Road is a really good spot for mountain bluebird in, in the winter. And um, I remember seeing my first mountain bluebirds in Southeast Arizona, and I was really surprised. I wasn't even expecting it. I was, um, you know, I'm very aware of Western bluebirds in our area and had it even, had it even really crossed my mind that mountain bluebirds would be around here. So, you know, I moved here at the end of 2014. I didn't see my first mountain bluebirds until I went with some friends up into the Santa Cruz Flats in the winter of 2015. So about a year and, and we were going up there to go look for some other birds and these mountain bluebirds were hanging out in these uh, agricultural fields. And I was like, whoa, that is so cool. I remember seeing these, you know, breeding areas in Montana and Wyoming and Washington State. This picture actually was taken in an area where I come from in Washington State around Allensburg, Washington uh, by Mick. And um, and then so after seeing them for the first time in the flats, I was like, wow, where else can I see these? And really a lot of the grassland areas are really good for wintering mountain bluebirds. And what I found is that Curly Horse Road is one of the best. And so um, I took my, my wife and my son to Patagonia the day after Thanksgiving. We came back uh, up through Sonoida and went on Curly Horse uh, just to see what was out there. And sure enough, a bunch of mountain bluebirds. So I'm gonna do a new share. I'm gonna take you to um, Google Maps and show you exactly where I was seeing them and kind of where Curly Horse, is, Curly Horse Road is at on this larger map. So you have the city of Tucson here, and then you take I-10 
east and just past Vale, you'll take Highway 83 south and you'll see signs for Sonoida. And once you get right around here, see La Cienegas here, you'll start getting in a grassland area all through here. And you, 83 goes right down into the town of Sonoida here. And Curly Horse Road is just north of Sonoida. It'll be this road right here. You're gonna see the name of it right there. So I'm gonna switch to a different layer. So you'll take Curly Horse Road here. This is all paved and there's these residences around here. But as you take Curly Horse, you wanna look at the top of every pole, look at the top of every, uh, you know, agave or whatever is sticking up out of the ground, yuccas and different mesquite trees, looking for loggerhead shrike, looking for kestrels, looking for uh, northern harriers, and of course, frugitious hawks or red-tailed hawks, the, the large hawks that you'll see perched around. Could have white-tailed kite through here, but you'll be on this long stretch, straight stretch, and um, once you get to right here, this area between this point Let's see if I can, from this point where you, you turn, you'll head north and you'll have, these would be agricultural fields kind of on this side, agricultural and kind of pasture. And this whole area right through here, really good for mountain bluebirds. Um, and mountain bluebirds and uh, lots of uh, Chihuahua and meadowlarks too. Chihuahua and meadowlark, recent split from uh, Eastern meadowlark. So it's a, it used to be a subspecies called Lillian. This is not confusing at all. It used to be a subspecies of Eastern Meadowlark called Lillian's Meadowlark, which they then made into a separate species, which is now Chihuahuan Meadowlark. So it is very confusing actually. But lots of Chihuahuan Meadowlarks through here and Mount Bluebirds. So you just want to look on all the different um, like like if there's sprinkler systems set out there or anything else, just look at the little perching point. Um, for Mount Bluebird. You'll probably find some Sage Phoebes. Uh, you might say it goes, uh, there's a pond right here. Usually I don't see anything at this pond. Um, I was thinking I'm going to, but there's nothing there. So don't worry about that pond. And then um, if I'm just doing curly horse, I'll turn it around right here. There's a, um, this, this right here, we're going to talk about in the next section. Uh, this leads to Smith Corral Canyon. So um, yeah, curly horse. Let me go back to this, the Mount Bluebird. Yeah, it's, Really easy, paved, about three miles of paved road. Uh, this past January, there are 84 species recorded there. So it's pretty pretty decent um, bird list that you'll get through there. You can get scaled quail as well. That might be something to look for. Um, a pretty neat spot and very easy, uh, accessible. And then it leads to something that's not quite as accessible, but if you're able to, to get into it, pretty neat spot to go and check out. And so this place is called Smith Canyon Corral and Tank. And this is a beautiful picture of a fruginous hawk, isn't it? Nice light face, fruginous, really white tail underneath. Just the rufous right in the armpit area. Uh, and it's just, they are heavy, big hawks. So when you're looking for fruginous hawk, you just wanna look for something that looks almost eagle-like. You can see uh, the bills like big and heavy. And uh, they have, uh, they just, they're about the same size as a red tail, but they seem bigger. So I don't kind of, if that makes sense or not. But this area right through here, Smith Canyon Corral and Tank is a good spot to find them. And let's go back. I'll talk about it. So there's a, there's, it's a little bit, um, when you're going into this area, it kind of feels like a spot you're not allowed to go in, but you are. You are. It's, it's all legit. It's all good to do. Uh, just uh, one of the main things that you want to do. 
So let me let me come back here. So again, here's Sonoida and Curly Horse Road right here. And you wind around. And then you'll get, as you wind around, you'll get to this point where it heads back up north again for the second time. And right where it heads back up north again, you'll see that there is this little spur road that goes out into this big ranch pasture area. Now on here it's labeled Curly Horse Road. It's just, it's just a kind of a, a really um, poorly maintained dirt road that's used by ranchers and goes out to a tank. So as you come off the main Curly Horse Road, there will be a gate that you have to open up right here and then come across and stop and then close the gate again. So to continue to have access into this area for the public, it's imperative to close the gate behind you. I mean, that's a that's it's the main reason why some areas become off limits to the public is because the public just doesn't follow those rules. So we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep the spot open and good. And I've taken different field trips back through here. It's it, it's um, it's worthwhile to keep on doing right. So you come in through this gate, you close it. It's one of those, it's not like a, a really nice gate, it's one of those old farm gates where, you know, you have the, the wire that kind of holds the post and then you kind of have to bend it, open it up and then bend it, put it back. Then you follow this two track road. Um, and you don't, this, you don't need four wheel drive for it, but it's really helpful to have high clearance if you do have that. And it's not very far, it's, um, it looks kind of far on here, but it's not. So you just follow this, this track and you'll kind of go up kind of high right here and then you'll start dropping down. And as you're driving on this road, you'll probably scare up horn marks. Horn marks are everywhere through there and they'll be on the road and they'll just get up right in front of you. And then you'll come down here. This right here is the corral. This is Smith Canyon Corral and around the corral. Uh, the past have had a uh, Baird Sparrow there, but it's usually a good spot for sparrows like Savannah and Vesper and maybe some chipping, maybe a grasshopper sparrow. Um, so lots of different possibilities there. And you just park here. And then you'll see as I come out here that this area right here, this is the tank. This is Smith Corral Canyon tank. And um, there's a path to walk through the fence. And uh, there's really, there's not much, much there's a little bit of a, a road that comes out here, not much of a trail though. So it's not like real accessible as like Curly Horse Road is accessible. Um, but if you're able to kind of walk off trail a little bit, then you can take that and come down to this tank. And that can be a good spot for uh, chestnut colored or thick billed long spur. Uh, also had gray horned owl through here before and um, some other good possibilities. It's about a quarter mile from the corral. Kind of lots of people call me there from the corral to the tank. So a little less than a quarter mile and uh, can hold some spray. So, um, you know, this can be a good spot for prairie falcon as well. Like lots of, uh, lots of raptors through here. White-tailed kite is one that you're gonna wanna look for as well. Both, both of those birds are, are much more common here during the winter than they are during the summer although it could be a possibility there during the summer too. But this is mainly a, a winter birding spot. Let's see. Yeah, I think that covers that area. Let's talk about one more spot here in uh, Las Cienegas and then see if there's some different questions concerning this area. Oh, there's the birds that we're gonna look for. Oh, I mentioned all those, good job. All right, so, uh, this beauty of a sparrow is a savannah sparrow, and savannah sparrows 
as we uh, bird into Davis Pasture, which is on the south side of the highway, you'll see a lot of savanna sparrows. And uh, some of us, um, sometimes we can get a little, um, a little excited about sparrow ID, right? It can be pretty daunting. It can be, uh, you know, there's uh, a little trepidation when it comes to separating savanna sparrow, bared sparrow, Vesper sparrow, chipping sparrow, and uh, just I what I would say is um, don't be nervous about it. Don't don't be worried about it. Just look at this as like your opportunity to learn, to grow, and to enjoy these birds. So this one here is Savannah. You got a little bit of hint of yellow right there, and it's a nice nice streaking on on the breast right here. And uh, yeah, that's a the nice looking savanna sparrow. Okay, they're kind of heavier and plumper a little bit. Okay, enough about savanna sparrow. Let's talk about Davis pasture. And let's go to the map and back to this layer. All right, so again, here's Sonoida. Now I got people calling me on myself. I should have had this turned off, I'm so sorry. Uh, so here we got Sonoida, Los Cienegas, right over here, okay, not that far, right over here, you have, oh, by the way, Arizona Hops and Vines, I went to this uh, vineyard a little while ago, it was great, but I, when it says hops and vines, I thought they would have beer and wine, they just have wine, so, I was a little disappointed with that, but still good. So I just saw that there. So <laughs> the uh, the south entrance for La Cienegas is this little road right here. So if you want to explore more La Cienegas, you can take this road and this will go all the way up to, you can see the Empire Ranch right here. So just so you, you have a feeling of where it's at, and this is Curly Horse right here, all right? Curly Horse right here. And this is the South Road. Now, Davis Pasture is an, when a bunch of thick-billed longspurs were being pretty seen, seen pretty regularly there. And it became its own little hot spot. Not, not birded very often, not known by a lot of people. But now you know about it. So here, this is the south entrance. If you're coming from Sonoida, right before you get to the south entrance for La Cienegas, you're going to have a right. So heading south on a dirt road that takes you down into Davis Pasture. So this road right here is the one that takes you to Davis Pasture. So I'm going to go to this. This road is a dirt road. It's not a bad road. Um, I think it's kind of, it's a little bit better than the one that gets you into Smith Corral Canyon and Tank, but it's still, it's, it's a dirt road. And it goes all the way down. And it goes down pretty far, but usually this is as far as I go. This is Davis Pasture Tank. And if you're going to be looking for long spurs, you always want to position yourself around these tanks because they like to come in there really quick, feed get some drink, get out of there. And um, when they're flying around, they look, look kind of like, like popcorn. So let me explain that. So in the grasslands area during the winter, you'll get different flocks of birds flying around. Two in particular um, that you'll see, one it, uh, flocks of horn larks. Horn larks, when they fly around, they are like, um, they fly together. So like if one turns left, they all turn left. If one turns right, they all turn right. They kind of, they're in sync together, or larks are. And long spurs, on the other hand, when they fly together, they kind of like, they're bouncy like popcorn. So like they'll pop up and down, not in sync with each other, just kind of like varying. They kind of bounce all around together. They all kind of move the same directions, but not in sync together. So when you're looking at these birds that are flying around and then coming into the tanks, look to see how they're flying, whether they're 
in sync together or whether they're kind of bobbing around like popcorn popping up sporadically. Um, but as you go down into this Davis pasture in tank, this is where I usually stop and turn around. This can be this whole around the tank, not only good for long spurs, but maybe the best spot in Los Angeles for Baird Sparrow. Baird Sparrow is really tricky. You want to do some research and look in your field guide about Baird Sparrow, listen to its call on Zeno Canto or on eBird and be aware of it. Uh, I know that I was looking on eBird at different Baird Sparrows reports and noticed that some people are playing their calls out there and stuff. It's a really sensitive species. So even though I, I do use playback for certain species, I wouldn't use playback for buried sparrow. Just be mindful of its call, look on the fence lines. This is this is actually one of the few birds that is active before it starts getting sunny. Maybe one of the few birds along with like short-eared owl or something like that, where you want to get there early, look along the fence lines and see if it's hopped up on one of the fence lines. But it's probably the best area in La Cienegas for it. Let me go back to this. Um, yeah, the tank is a good turnaround spot. Here's uh, some chestnut colored long spurs. This is a photo taken by our conservation biologist, Jenny McFarland. You can see the white in their tail right here. There's some other, it's amazing how many of these uh, grassland birds have white in the tail different amounts of white. Metal larks have white in the tail. Horn larks have white in the tail. Esper sparrows have white in the tail. But they all have different amounts of white, which is kind of interesting. So, but these are, these long spurs, they'll come into these tanks, just like you see here, get something and then head back out. Um, There's a pretty cool sight to see, and we only have them here in the winter. Um, Kirsten, any uh, questions in the chat or maybe someone has a question they'd like to ask, you can raise your hand or. Yeah, I don't think there's anything we missed in the chat other than there are folks asking if you'd be willing to share uh, your slides either in PDF form or um, just as the PowerPoint. Sure, yeah, um, if, if you'd like the slides, you can go ahead and, and just email me and um, yeah, I can send them to you. That's no problem. I have no problem with that. Awesome. Looks like Peter has a question. Go ahead, Peter. Got you on mute right now. Oh. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, yep. How... How long is the distance along the dirt road in the, the off of Curly Horse Road from the gate to the tank? Yeah, I, it's, I think it's about quarter mile at the most, not very far. Uh, that's what you said it was from the corral to the tank. How about from, oh. from the gate where you go off of the main road? Um, I, th I think that's about a quarter mile too. That's right. Yeah. So uh, it's about a quarter mile walk, or maybe not even a quarter mile walk from the corral to the tank, but then to drive from uh, where you cross through the gate to the corral, it's no more, it's probably right around that quarter mile mark as well. I can't remember specifically, but it's not very far. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, no problem. Let me go back. Any, any other questions there concerning Los Cienegas? We did have a question. Um, it's kind of a, maybe a more involved one. Okay, is, we'll see. We'll see if we'll see if we do it or pass. Um, the difference between the Western Meadowlarks and the Chihuahuan Meadowlarks. Ooh, no, that's a good one. All right, let me go to eBird for that. That'll help us so we can look at them together. Okay, so here's eBird. And um, let's go to explore. And let's go to explore species. Let's go, let's look at Chihuahuan Metal Art first. So the main thing 
to be mindful of with Chihuahua metal arc and Western metal arc is what they sound like. So that'll be the big thing here. Let me actually, um, cause I didn't sh share with sound enabled. So let me go back to share with sound. Here's Chihuahua metal arc. Let's start by listening to it. Uh, let's use Janine. I, I know Janine. That'd be good. Let's see if she got a good recording. I'm going to play this. That's just a call. I want the song. All right. Lawrence Halsey, one of our, uh, past board members and filter pleaders. Let's listen to his. Ah. Go again right here. Very smooth like. Let's listen to it one more time. And then here. All right, before we look at it, let's go to Western Metal Arc right here. LNS catalog number 61551. Sternilla Neglectric on Library Cut 35, Western Metal Arc, Valmarie, Saskatchewan, May 15, 1961. Dang, I wasn't uh, ready for this one. Let's let's find uh, this one. Looks like it should be a song. See. A little bit different than the Eastern Miller. Let's listen to it again. It's going to come look at the sonogram right here. See, Western Metal Arc is a little bit more, a little bit more bouncy in the flute. And then when you go back to, uh, yeah, so Western Metal Arc, a little bit more kind of bouncy, kind of all over the place flute like. And then the Chihuahua, let's listen to it one more time. It's just much more straightforward. Anyway, I, I think the sound is, is really the biggest difference. You'll look at some of the Chihuahua Millwork will have more white in the tail. Look at, here's a good picture of the tail right here. Look how much white we talked about white in the tails with like long spurs. Look how much white is in the tail on this guy. Like there's a lot of white in a Chihuahua metal arc tail, the outer tail feathers. You can see it's also pretty white right here. The eyebrow, very pale, almost white. Now let's look at Western metal arc. Let's see if there's a good flat. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. A little less white. <laughs> There's not much of a difference, right? But a little less white. And then you can see the eyebrow is more of a yellowish beige color rather than really white. So like Lillian's, or not Lillian's, that's what I used to call them. Chihuahua Metal Arc, more white in the tail, wider eyebrow. There's some other things that you can get even more intense with it. But then the, how, the call, the song, is a really big indicator too. Western metal arcs tend to be more in kind of uh, agriculture areas here in Southeast Arizona. So like you go into like Santa Cruz Flats, you go into some more cultivated agriculture areas, parks, that kind of stuff, you'll get more Western metal arcs. Chihuahua metal arcs, if you're more out in like, um, kind of more wild areas, like more grassland, wild areas, you're more likely to get Chihuahuan. They do intermix though. They can be pretty difficult to tell apart.
But in these areas that I'm talking about, you're much more likely to get chihuahua and metallurgy. But there are Western in there too, in the winter. In the summer, no Western, only chihuahua. So it's kind of easier in the summer with metal arcs. A little bit harder in the winter. That's all right, hard is good. All right, that's enough about metal arcs. That's a good question. Let's talk about one of, let's go to an area that's much more accessible, much more closer to Tucson. Even though for me, it feels like it's an eternity away when I drive there, Agua Caliente Park. The Agua Caliente Park is on the northeast side of Tucson, way out at the base of Catalina foothills. And uh, you may have heard recently that it was it suffered a really bad burn. You know, I have a surprise that I hadn't talked about it in any of our where to go birding uh, presentations before, but it was because it was closed for a long time during COVID. And then, um, and then this burn happened earlier this year. I actually was gonna talk about it and decided not to because it was closed. It's been recently reopened. You can see the area that was burned here, these palm trees. A uh, bunch of palm trees are taken out. Some of these that you see here, these are burned, but they're, they're still alive. Um, but it's the 10th, has the 10th highest species count of any birding hotspot in Pima County. Isn't it crazy? Just like a normal little park, right? In the town of Tucson that is loaded with birds all throughout the year. 137 species have been recorded there in December. Uh, not just this December, but that's all Decembers. Um, still a really good number um, and offers some really good birding right now. So let, let's talk about some of those birds, how to bird Agua Caliente Park. Actually, before we go to what to look for, let me just show you on the map where it's at. I was like that. Let's go back to a different layer. Let's move out of Sonoida. All right, let's go back up to Tucson. So you have Tucson here, you can see where I'm at. That's my little blue spot. And Agua Caliente Park is way over here. You can see it, the little green spot right there. You can see it's just, uh, just south of the foothills. It's about a 45 minute drive from where I'm at right now. So it's a long ways if you're in Midtown, but if you're on the east side, it's a really um, a good spot to go in and check out. Now back to what birds you can see there, the important stuff. So right now you get um, quite a few different waterfowl species there. Uh, lots of ringneck duck. It, ringneck duck is probably the most common waterfowl species you'll get there. And I, oh, I believe I have a picture of a ringneck duck on the next slide. Oh yeah, there he is. We'll get back to that guy right there. My second favorite duck species. Um, but you could also get hooded merganser. That's kind of a, a, a nice, uh, close to a rarity um, in our area. They're pretty pretty regular at Agua Caliente Park. So if you're looking for a hooded merganser, uh, belted kingfisher, lots of different herons or egrets like green heron, snowy egret, blue heron, um, there's a resident great horned owl that um, I'll give you a, an idea of where you might look for a great horned owl here in a little bit. You'll have tons of vermilion flycatchers. So if you're coming here from out of town and you'd really like to get a good picture of a vermilion flycatcher, you're going to want to hit up some of our parks, most notably Reed Park in Midtown Tucson or Agua Caliente Park. Either, either one you'll have many opportunities to get good pictures of vermilions. Uh, what you would get here at Agua Caliente, not at Reed Park, is a lot of our Sonoran Desert regular species like cactus wren, black-tailed gnatcatcher, rufous wing sparrow. Uh, so a lot of those guys that you'll find, fanal pepla and curveville thrasher, of course. Uh, this time of year, the winter, western bluebird is pretty common through there. Bluebirds are, I mean, we talked about mountain bluebird earlier. Uh, bluebirds just tend to be a, a bird that we love to see. Uh, Northern Cardinals there too, so you get the blues and the reds. And um, you'll get lots of yellow rump warblers, but it's also a good spot for wintering black-throated grays. 
Uh, so th those are some possibilities, some things to think about as you go to uh, the park and kind of gear up for what you might see. Don't be disappointed if you don't see all of these, but um, it's they're all de definite possibilities. Some things to think about uh, for Agua Caliente is, um, it's kind of surprising, some of the best birding, there's some houses and office area kind of right near the parking area. And that's really can be the best spot to find a lot of these warblers, different woodpeckers like red named sapsucker, or ladderback woodpecker, sparrows. Um, I I was actually I actually went there yesterday. Um, you know, it was raining here almost all day yesterday, but I caught this little break where I was like, I just need to get outside. I knew I was going to be talking about Agua Caliente today, and I went there and right around the house there was this one bush that had the most burden in it that I've ever seen of one bush or tree ever in my life. There was like, I, I think there was eight to 10 verdin, just this one little bush. I should have looked to see what kind of bush it was, but it wasn't very big. And it, it almost looked like, you know, bush tits because normally you don't see that many verdin all hanging out together. Bush tit is kind of a, a relative of verdin that you do see in clumps like that. But I was just pretty, uh, surprised by how many birds. So it's like that that whole area around the house can be really good. So don't don't neglect that. Don't be like me. Usually I want to get as far away from those offices and houses and you know um, people places. <laughs> want to get out somewhere away from everything, but that area tended to be really good. Um, it can get crowded on holidays and weekends. So even as you know, even in the winter especially in the winter at times. Um, so if you do visit there, go, I, I would I would suggest not going on a weekend, going during the, the week, or if you do go on a weekend, get there early uh, before um, it gets really busy. There's some other ponds. We'll look at, at, at the map here real quickly about, um, you can, there's like a trail system out there. The whole trail system itself is about a mile and a half if you kind of do figure eight loops through it. Um, but like I said, most of the best birding is right there around the main lake and, and, and the house. So here, actually, let's go to, uh, let's look at the park here. Let's go to this and I'll show you where those trails are at. All right, so here's Agua Caliente Park. You come, you come up Soldier Trail Road, Take a right on Roger, go east, and then you'll hit the entrance right here. And you see the parking area. This is the office house structures I was talking about. Right here, right next to the parking lot. The little verdant bush is like right there where my arrow's at. This is the area that was burned where these palm trees are at. Uh, but you can walk over here. And uh, you can see that this is a not a road, but a trail system. So all of this through here is paved and it's paved for a good portion of it. And then it becomes dirt over here. These ponds do have water in them and you can walk all this. This is where a lot of the good Sonoran desert habitat is at, but you'll have those same birds over here. Um, I had Western bluebirds right in here, right below this, this little pond here. Uh, but like I said, most of the really best birding is right, surprisingly right in the center of everything. And let's go back here. Boom. This is what the trails look like away from the paved pathway. So it's more like flat dirt. Um, because this, I took this picture yesterday, it just rained a whole bunch. So usually it doesn't look this wet and damp. Uh, but really easy trails around there too, once you get off the paved area, so pretty accessible. And um, it, again, there wasn't as many birds out in this area, but there was a few. So great horned owl. Everyone loves owls. Usually I don't give locations of owls, but this one, so this one is really, you can walk up to this point and that's about as close as you can get because past this fence right here is all marked and you aren't able to go back in there. So you're at a really safe distance, but 
I'll show you on the map where this is at. So this is kind of like the southern end of the lake. And you walk along the edge and you can't walk, like I said, you can't walk anything past this. And you look out into these palm trees and right about right there, I saw the face of a great horned owl sticking up out of the palm tree. Owls, great horn and barn owls especially love to roost in palm trees like this. I remember we used to have a nice palm tree in Sweetwater Wetlands and every once in a while we'd have a barn owl kind of hooked up in there roosting and uh, they can be kind of hard to find but you just take a moment and uh, first look with your bare eyes out of the palm see if you see anything different and then just look about with your binoculars about just below the, the green level of the palm trees and look for little heads little different shapes that maybe um, shouldn't be there look for those eyes look for any they don't really move much but there might be some head movement um, but just kind of glass up there so this area right here if we go back to our map the parking area and uh, this is like i said this is where it was burned so this is all fenced off you can't go in this area but you can walk along the edge of the lake right here and this is about where that fence is at where you can't go any further. There's a fence here and you just stand like right there where that marker is at and you look out into these palm trees over here and this is where he usually hangs out. So it's a nice safe distance but you get to see an owl which is always a special thing. All right let's go back to that. Uh, like it's, there's been some kind of pretty rare birds that have been seen at Agua Caliente just in the past couple of weeks. Uh, Eastern Phoebe, not this specific Eastern Phoebe, but a different Eastern Phoebe was was seen there just a couple of days ago. I didn't see yesterday. I didn't see any of these yesterday, <laughs> but they've been seen in the past week or so. Eastern Phoebe, Rusty Blackbird. Rusty Blackbird is uh, really rare for this area. There's actually one seen in La Cienegas recently too, so it's kind of weird. Golden ground sparrow, uh, and then not as rare, but still pretty notable, red crossbill and mountain bluebird flying over. So um, lots of different possibilities when it comes to rare birds at Agua Caliente Park. Um, any, any questions when it comes to uh, Agua Caliente? I don't think we had anything in the chat, but... Um... Folks are willing to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and ask your questions. Hi, hi, Luke. This is Laurel Salvador. And hey, Laurel, how are you doing? Pretty good. So, um, yeah, I'm back in Chicago suburbs. But I'm just curious because Linda Hansen and I went biked out there, and we we luckily we had our binocs because we were mainly biking. But we we really think what we saw and and I really double checked it I checked Ebert I checked Sibley we had Binox was a common merganser female because it was much okay. yeah it had a very brown head a very gray body and it seemed like more streamlined is that yeah, but yeah. I was afraid the Ebert police were going to get me oh <laughs> but I I did a... <laughs> but we did put it and I really do think that's what it was and it was the week after they had just opened so it was only two days after they opened so of course he yeah. thought it was unreported but um i did explain that it was closed so um but anyway right. i'm pretty sure there's like there was a female common merganser there hanging out yeah see that that's a really cool sighting thanks for sharing that laurel i'm sure that's what it was i, I trust you and linda and uh i know common mergansers have while they're rare have been reported from there before i we get them every once in a while, like at um, uh, Lakeside Park, um, Christopher Columbus Park. I, you never know what's going to turn up. There was a black scoter, a black scoter, which is like a seabird, a sea duck, that was uh, reported and seen by lots of people at Reed Park. Wow. So, like, you just never know what's going to show up. And, you know, when it comes to e birding something, man, yeah. Go for it. Don't don't be afraid of the eBird police. 
Eber police uh, are there to support you. Yes, I know. And I I actually do. I do learn a lot from them. I just like to joke. We call. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I know. I I we joke about it because there's every joke has like a you know whether we want to admit or not a hint of truth to it. So there is some trepidation, right? right? <laughs> Oh, uh, Laurel, that's cool. Thanks yeah, because I didn't have a photo. Okay, I'll go back to mute. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. All right, if there's no other questions about Agua Caliente, I wanted to just talk briefly about where else to go this winter. There's a lot of really good locations that, you know, we just, you know, not focusing on today. But uh, Whitewater Draw, Wilcox and Cochise Lake, Amazing spots for sandhill cranes. I mean, there's really if if someone was um, visiting here uh, from somewhere else, and like whenever my parents come here from Washington State, like if I'm gonna take them somewhere to go experience Southeast Arizona in winter, I'll take them to Whitewater Draw, or I'll take them to Patagonia Lake State Park. Those are like two great wildlife viewing areas that are really easy, pretty accessible. Um, so like the birding there is amazing. So like if, if you have any questions on these, we can talk about those right now, or you can always email me. Uh, I can point you in the direction of different talks that we've done before on those areas. Another one that I'll just mention real briefly is Luckett Road in Marana. Uh, usually get a lot of um, phone calls this time of year about burrowing owls and whether you can see burrowing owls up there. Yes, you can still see the burrowing owls up there off of Luckett Road in Hardin. It's also a fantastic spot for raptors right now. <clears throat> and some raptors like Crested Caracara that you wouldn't get in areas like La Cienegas or um, Sulphur Springs Valley around Whitewater. So you get Caracara there, you'll get Frugin's Hawk, you'll get Peregrine Falcon there along Luckett Road. Um, so a really good spot to go and check it out. Um, any any questions about any of these spots or any, any other... Uh, general questions about birding in the area in, in the winter that I can help out with, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, depart and hopefully get some birding in the next couple of days. Any questions? Any thoughts? Wow, no questions? Are you going to be doing a Christmas bird count? I am. I I'm, get to do one tomorrow. I'm pretty excited about the Tucson Valley Christmas bird count. I used to compile it. And thankfully, I'm not compiling it anymore. But uh, I am doing a route that goes up to the top of Mount Kimball, which is, if you're familiar with Finger Rock, you see Finger Rock way up in the uh, Catalinas. Uh, Catalinas. Yeah, so going up to the top of Finger Rock and probably yeah. get in the snow. Uh, I did just report um, yeah. that Mark oh, Stevenson saw. Here. I was asking. Oh, whoops. Good. Uh, go ahead, Karen. Oh, okay. Um, if I, if you. People who were bored a little bit, I did send you personally over by email those fish. Oh, you did send <laughs> Okay. I'll, <laughs> if somebody I'll wants to do an ID at a fish. Okay. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Luke, I, I did share in the chat that Mark Stevenson during your presentation just shared that there was a black throated blue warbler at Ago Caliente right now. No. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, did a female or a male? Did it say? Um, no, it was on the group me, so I it didn't say. But two people have seen it today. <sighs> I did not see it. Black through the blue, one of my favorite warblers. Uh, hey, let's let's uh, let me share my let, let's go and look at that on um, eBird. So I, I don't I don't want to contradict, but it looks like it's at Ventana Canyon, not Agua Caliente. Oh, Ventana Canyon? Or yeah, maybe which, is, which is actually closer. It is. <laughs> but that that I don't know, Piggy, is that 
I just looked up the um, the coordinates that they put in the group me chat. You are right, and I am wrong. Okay, I just okay. I just wanted to make sure we weren't sending people to the wrong place looking for the bird. <laughs> well, first let's 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 look at that. So Ventana Canyon. Here, let's first look at Ventana Canyon, and then if, if you want to stick around and look at Black Throat Blue Warblers with me, you can. But uh, Ventana Canyon. Ooh, I hope that sticks around for sat Saturday and the uh, Catalina Mountains Christmas bird count. That would be really good. Oh, that would be cool. So here's Ventana Canyon. It's uh, here's here's Tucson. Here's the Rio River. Uh, let's scroll into here. This will be probably um, yeah, Craycroft. So Craycroft, major north south route, and you go up Craycroft. Uh, just keep going north, and that winds around. You'll see Lowe's Ventana Canyon Resort. There's a little turnoff that goes north just before the resort that takes you to a uh, parking area for Ventana Canyon. And then, uh, of course, I, I don't, my guess is that it's probably really low, probably close to the parking area, because that's, so you get up higher, maybe not as conducive to a lot of warblers, but there are some, uh, there's a couple cottonwoods near the parking area of Ventana Canyon that I'm guessing is probably where it's at. Like, I have no idea. But that's where Ventana Canyon is at. Just for reference, Sabino, Sabino's over here. But here's Sabino, here's Ventana. And then this is probably Finger Rock. This is what I'm doing tomorrow over here. So it's kind of right in the middle. And let's look at Black Throated Blue, which is a beautiful warbler. The male. Here's a male. It is a male that they reported there. Okay, awesome. So the, what I really like about the black throat of blue that maybe sometimes kind of goes unnoticed is this little white handkerchief right here in the wing. And so that's a really good marker. It, it Now this one's a male that being seen. So not as big of a thing, but when you have a female, look, it's got the white handkerchief too. So whenever you see a little white handkerchief in the wing like this, good for a black throat blue warbler. They're kind of uh, kind of a heavier warbler, so a little bit heavier than uh, like uh, orange crown. They're kind of, if I remember right, uh, now I'm trying to remember. But anyways, look for that white handkerchief. Of course, if you have a male black throat blue, it's going to be a little bit easier. <laughs> cool, thanks for sharing that, Peggy. I put the GPS coordinates in the chat. Fabulous. Oh, it looks like you might have just sent it to me, Peggy, here. I can copy it. All right. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then um, I think we might be able to wrap up. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we hope that you'll go and check out some new birding spots this winter and report back to us what you see and maybe if you're in town and have time today go get that black-throated um blue warbler thank yeah. you all right thank you have a good rest of your day happy holidays merry christmas see you guys later happy holidays. Happy holidays. thanks everybody